A small web hosting company based in Southern California called Beverly Hills Internet, which had only opened up for business the year before, came up with a marketing idea intended to bring in new users. They decided to give away website home pages to anyone who wanted one, with each user getting 15 megabytes of space, which is almost nothing now, but was a huge amount of space back in the 90s and they organized these pages based on a made-up geography. When new users signed up to get their free web page, they'd be shown a list of different neighborhoods they could join, which included options like Beverly Hills for shopping and fashion, Bourbon Street for jazz and Cajun food, Eureka for small businesses, and Area 51 for science fiction and fantasy pages. This collection of neighborhood-divided free pages were based at geocities.com, and the benefits users were given expanded over time, from additional neighborhood options to drag-and-drop website building tools to chat rooms, comment sections, bulletin boards, and visitor count trackers, little visible tallies that increased by one every time somebody visited the page. Geocities became immensely popular for a variety of reasons, but a core among them is that it made building a website super accessible, especially compared to the other options available at the time. My first web page was a GeoCities page, and most other people I know who were at all involved with the early commercial era of the internet probably had their own GeoCities page at some point as well. And the tools they made available alongside that free chunk of server space allowed those of us who were not tech world professionals to catch a glimpse of what the web might become someday. A place where you could write and post things and actually, maybe, have them be seen by someone. Someone living in another town, another country, somewhere else around the world. What's more, these pages were early demonstrations of some of the experimental tooling around that was happening in the wider world of HTML, particularly, and how different browsers were handling the diverse range of new HTML coding options that were emerging, many of which did not work in all browsers, and some of which were meant to help the browsers that did support them win the then-ongoing first browser war. And I did an episode on the browser wars previously, if you're keen to learn more about that specifically. By 1997, GeoCities had introduced advertising. A premium tier had welcomed its millionth user and was the fifth most popular website on the internet. In 1998, GeoCities IPO'd, listing its stock on the NASDAQ exchange starting out at $17, but ending the year at over $100 per share. By 1999, GeoCities was the third most visited site on the web, after AOL and Yahoo, and that year, the peak of what would later be dubbed the dot-com bubble, Yahoo bought GeoCities for $3.57 billion in stock. This was not a popular move to most GeoCities users. Yahoo introduced a new terms of service that said the company owned the rights and content published by all users of GeoCities sites, including photos and other media that they posted. A whole lot of users left at that point, leading Yahoo to reverse their decision, though quite a bit of reputational damage had already been done. In 2001, GeoCities had yet to become profitable, and Yahoo brought down the monetary hammer, reducing data transfer rates for free users and lower-tier customers, while also introducing a higher-tier offering, kind of like an airline making coach seats more uncomfortable intentionally, hoping that it would cause more people to upgrade for an additional fee. Instead of upgrading, though, many people continued to leave, and the site, though still popular, bled away a lot of its original users and its most influential users. Yahoo announced that it would close GeoCities in 2009, 
alongside a bunch of other services that they had built and acquired that were not paying off as the company had hoped. The service continued for another decade in Japan, though, as it did a whole lot better as a premium service there for whatever reason, but for many in the United States in particular, the closing of GeoCities demonstrated, as the editor of tech news site ZDNet said at the time, quote, that you could have something really popular and still not make any money on the internet, end quote. Most GeoCities sites today are no longer accessible. Though the non-profit Internet Archive, among other entities, did their best to capture and commemorate the network of pages for posterity, and the Archive Team, a volunteer group that attempts to archive the Internet, especially dying communities on a large scale, archived the GeoCities network of sites and has since released it as a massive torrent file that anyone who is curious to see what that period of Internet history looked like can download and explore at their leisure. One of the main legacies the GeoCities era of the web leaves behind is a sort of innocent tackiness that emerged as a consequence of the aforementioned new HTML capabilities alongside the lack of anything that we might call beautiful examples of websites that were widely available, at least not in a way that normal people would know how to find them and know how to access them. And the fact that most of these pages were little projects people put together on a whim or for hobbies or for their side obsessions. Basically, there wasn't a huge surge of pro-level content out there at this time. And GeoCity sites emerged out of non-designer, non-developer, not necessarily computer-savvy people being handed the fundamentals of a website and then a bunch of decorative tools the equivalent of internet bedazzlers, and being told to go at it. And they did. They really went at it. GeoCities sites were covered in bright, clashing colors, flashing animated typography, and they were wallpapered in pixelated GIFs. At this point in internet history, there was not really a way to post actual videos or high-res images or anything more complicated than the most basic layouts and graphics but you could use crazy fonts and all the hex colors you could imagine and GIF and image-based proto-memes that were often so random and silly that especially if you hadn't spent much time on the web before, which was the case for the majority of people at this point in history, it all presented a very strange default starting point that was kind of charming and unthreatening and even a bit naive. What I'd like to talk about today is another technology, another platform of sorts that emerged shortly after the GeoCities era and which changed the web and how we engage on it, while also bridging the gap between two moments in tech history, despite, much like GeoCities, only existing for a relatively small amount of actual, real-world time. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. Folks who contribute a regular amount, any amount, each month via patreon.com slash let's know things receive an additional episode of the show each month. But all shapes and sizes of support are very much appreciated, monetary or non-monetary. You can find a list of different ways to help support this show at letsknowthings.com slash support. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from The Verge, and it's entitled Congregate.com Stops Accepting New Games as Flash Slowly Disappears. In 1993, a product called Smart Sketch was released by a company called Future Wave Software. This product was a vector drawing application built for an operating system called Penpoint OS, an operating system meant for early digital assistants and graphics tablets like the EO Personal Communicator produced by AT&T, devices that didn't do terribly well on the market due to their lack of overall utility. 
but also because, as we know now, in the age of touchscreens, high-powered wireless communication and charging, tiny batteries, high-resolution screens, the tech just wasn't there yet to build a truly compelling mainstream portable device, much less a portable device meant for tapping and drawing upon with a stylus or a finger. Thus, Penpoint OS and alongside it, SmartSketch failed to find a customer base. SmartSketch was half-heartedly ported over to Microsoft Windows and Mac OS in the hope that someone using these more popular desktop-based operating systems would figure out a use for it on their devices, but it didn't go very far, and FutureWave opted to sell the software, approaching, among others, Adobe in 1995. But Adobe and most of these other companies did not express much interest. They were turned down. But then, later that year, Microsoft opted to use some of FutureWave's animated content, made using that same software which had been rebranded as Future Splash. And Microsoft decided to use it as part of an online TV network that they wanted to build. Disney Online used Future Splash vector animations as well for a small subscription-based product that they were producing called Disney's Daily Blast. And Fox began using Future Splash software to make their, at the time, new Simpsons animated TV show. The following year, in late 1996, Future Splash was acquired by Macro Media, a company that at the time was best known for its director software, which allowed users to make animations, presentations, to burn CD-ROMs, which was a thing people did back then, and produce content for information kiosks. They also made a product called AuthorWare, which allowed folks to make interactive learning software. And as the internet shifted from being a primarily university-based and research tool to becoming a more commercially available thing, Macromedia developed a piece of software called Dreamweaver, which allowed users to create web pages using a drag-and-drop interface, alongside Shockwave, which was a browser plugin for their director software. They also acquired the vector drawing program Freehand, and soon after, the Photoshop-like raster and vector graphics program Fireworks. Future Splash was thus rebranded as Macromedia Flash, and released as an editor, which allowed users to produce graphics and animations, alongside a free player plugin, which would allow folks on the other end of things to play animations produced with the Flash software in their browser for free. Between 1996 and 1999, Flash was upgraded to include movie clips, which allowed folks with this plugin to play movie files, a simple Flash-based scripting language called Actions, and a slew of other animation-focused capabilities. In 2000, the first major version of Action Script, a more advanced version of Actions, was released with Flash version 5, and version 2.0 of Action Script was released with Flash MX 2004. This added object-oriented programming, better user interface components, and a bunch of other quality-of-life upgrades that made Flash a far more compelling option when it came to a variety of online, media-based use cases. Flash 8, the next version, added even more visual flourishes alongside upgrades for their FLV video format. In December of 2005, Adobe, the creator of Photoshop and other such tools that did not want to buy the earlier version of Flash, remember, bought Macromedia, which added Dreamweaver, Director, Shockwave, Fireworks, Authorware, and Flash to their growing portfolio of creation-oriented products. Some of these tools were discontinued shortly after the acquisition. I actually was at university during this transition phase and learned freehand, fireworks, and other formerly Macromedia, newly Adobe software as part of my classwork, only to have some of this software disappear while I was still in school learning how to use these software suites, which was awkward for me and my fellow students, but also for the professors who were stuck with a course outline that was diminishing in value as they taught it. The software that did stick around, though, was rapidly iterated, 
and this included Flash, which was now called Adobe Flash CS3 Professional. The name's just getting more complex as time went by. Flash's capabilities really exploded over the subsequent five years leading up to 2008, with more modern programming options, 3D animation capabilities, all kinds of interoperability with other media like graphics and video, and the formalization of a desktop-focused Flash player called Air, short for Adobe Integrated Runtime, which made it easier to build what amounted to desktop software using Flash as opposed to web-focused options that were the default up until that point. In 2011, a few things happened that changed the seeming destiny of Flash. First, a new Flash player for the web was released, alongside Stage 3D, which allowed for faster, more capable 3D rendering within Flash applications, which made the format seemingly more suitable for higher-end video games and software. They also added upgraded functionality for Android and iOS platforms to still relatively new operating systems. The first iPhone having been launched mid-2007, the smartphone era really kicking off a few years later, so 2011 was still relatively early days into that transition, leading up to the point where everyone had a smartphone in many parts of the world. We weren't at that point yet. Adobe was beginning to see some not-so-ideal shifts in Flash market share at that same moment, though, in part as a result of an open letter that was written in mid-2010 by the co-founder and then-CEO of Apple, Steve Jobs. Jobs basically, point by point, outlined why Flash wasn't very good, and why it would not be allowed on iOS products, including the iPhone, iPod Touch, and iPad, in the future. Some Apple customers were quite irked by this, and Adobe wasn't pleased either, publishing a counter letter saying, in essence, that Apple devices struggled with Flash because Apple sucks, not the other way around. Now, slightly larger context here, leading up to this moment, there was already a fair bit of speculation that Apple would figure out a way to get rid of Flash because it competed with their own internal app store in terms of making various sorts of software, media, and games available to users. And Flash usually did it for free. If people could just download free Flash games and videos, why would they pay Apple for the content in their app store? It also seemed more than a little hypocritical to some analysts and users that Apple was partially decrying the use of Flash because it was owned by Adobe. It was a proprietary format as opposed to an open one like HTML or JavaScript. This seemed like a ludicrous criticism to some because Apple is famously a walled garden company, making use of a great deal of proprietary everything they claim to maintain a consistent standard of quality across their devices and other offerings. So although Jobs focused on technical rationales in his letter, many people saw this move as a money grab by Apple. Whatever the rationales, though, from that point forward, Flash was seen as a recently dominant online media format that had been banned from a quickly growing, incredibly popular set of devices that, although not the massive force they are today in 2020, were already considered to be a new standard, especially within creative industries, all the way back in 2011. At the time, there were still some BlackBerry devices out in the wild, and Android had quite a bit of market share. But living out in LA and working in a creative field at the time, it was unusual for me to see someone who had something other than an iPhone at this point. It was both a status symbol and a creative tool, the sort of thing that wasn't in most hands, but was definitely in the most influential hands. And I think that was more true then because these devices were less ubiquitous. Jobs proposed in his now famous letter that the online world, the web in particular, should be based on free and open protocols. And that meant using HTML, CSS, 
and JavaScript technologies that at the time were kind of a backbone for the web. HTML says where to put objects on the screen, CSS says what they should look like, and JavaScript tells them how to behave. But JavaScript in particular at this time was seen as being quite slow and clunky and not at all ideal for mobile devices. HTML and CSS, though good for basic layout and styling, were not at all capable when it came to media beyond the bare basics of maybe placing an image in the body of a website. This proclamation, though, alongside ongoing developments within the web and burgeoning mobile web space at the time, fed into a resurgence that was already percolating within the HTML, CSS, JavaScript communities, revolving around the empowerment of a new standard called HTML5, which in 2011 kind of just meant more of the same, but with the implication that it would soon iterate into something substantial and something that could replace much of what Flash was doing online, but with fewer potential security issues, less cumbersome file sizes, and less battery drain on devices, especially mobile devices, which was very much an increasing concern. It took a while, but this promised HTML-based future did eventually arrive. Today, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are massively more powerful and capable than their 2011 era ancestors. And as someone who used to build Flash sites back in that earlier period, I am frankly blown away by just how comparably simple and streamlined this trio of languages is today compared to how things were back then when we had to use Flash if we wanted to do just about anything, including little things that we take for granted today, like embedding a video in a web page. Perceiving this trend line, Adobe changed the name of the Flash development software to Adobe Animate in 2015, segueing from a purely Flash environment to also helping users develop animations using HTML and other formats. And in mid-2017, they announced that Flash would be end-of-life, meaning they would no longer support the format at the end of 2020. As of the day I'm recording this, in mid-July 2020, Flash is disabled by default on many modern web browsers, as the code required to run Flash script is seen as a security threat that could be hijacked by bad actors on the internet to inject malicious code into users' devices. As of January 2021, most browsers seem to be planning to completely block the Flash plugin from even being used for that same reason, and Adobe announced that they would probably be adding a time bomb mechanism to their Flash software, so that once the format becomes unsupported, it will essentially delete itself from the computers of people who might otherwise unknowingly keep it installed, leaving themselves open to potential future security threats. So Flash, as a format, including FLV videos, Swift Flash applications in movies, and FLA Flash development files. They're all on their way out. But during its heyday, which arguably began in the early 2000s under Macromedia, but really took off after it was acquired by Adobe around 2007, with the release of the first Adobe-branded version of the project, lasting until probably 2011, Flash massively influenced a great many industries and sub-industries by becoming one of the de facto multimedia formats of the internet, and arguably at that time, the most ubiquitous of such formats. Which brings us back around to that article from The Verge. Congregate was an incredibly popular website during that period, the precursor, it could be argued, to many of today's gaming platforms like Steam and Epic, and GOG. And Congregate has, in recent years, taken on some of the attributes of those newer platforms, introducing their own game store called Cartridge in 2018, but they are still most well-known for being the place to find weird, interesting, sometimes brilliant, sometimes completely horrible Flash games, beginning in 2006, and as mentioned in this article, ending in late July 2020. The site will remain active and is doing its best to continue hosting as many of these games as possible, 
allowing developers to upload new versions of their games that are compatible with other mostly HTML5-centric formats, and in some cases, maintaining Flash emulators that replicate the games within a faux Flash environment. Many of the site's other offerings, though, including game-specific chat rooms, which were super popular back then, are disappearing because they, too, were often built using Flash. Some of the most defining online video games, from Words with Friends to Farmville to the incredibly bizarre and strangely disturbing, yet also quite fun, Quop, Q-W-O-P, were first developed and published in Flash. Many professional game developers today got started in Flash, and though most have now segued to other, often more mobile-friendly formats, the Flash gaming moment, though relatively short in duration, brought immense new powers to independent developers in particular because of the capabilities these tools offered to individual game makers, but also because of the distribution it enabled. You could publish a fully realized one-person built game on your own website or on a central platform like Congregate for free. This gave game makers who would have otherwise never been able to afford the hardware and software necessary to make sophisticated video games the ability to do so from home or from school, and it gave them distribution that at the time would have only been available to major video game studios. As of mid-2020, Congregate has 128,000 or so games on its platform. That's a lot of opportunities for developers who would not have otherwise had a means of disseminating their work. And this is just one of many platforms that emerged during this short-lived but influential Flash era. Flash's influence is not limited to games, though. Some of the earliest multimedia memes were enabled by and spread using Flash. The Llama Song, Hamster Dance, End of the World animation, and other video and animation-based gimmicks fed into bigger, longer-lasting properties like Homestar Runner, a Flash-era entity that still exists today, though using a different format than before, very often. A great many of these online institutions, by the way, were supported by online advertising, an industry that exploded in terms of capability, diversity, and measurability during the Flash Age. Whereas the early internet made fair use of static images for banner ads and other newspaper-like graphic-based advertising imagery, Flash allowed advertisers to post videos, animations, and what amounted to many games that would trick or convince or compel users to click on things that they otherwise probably wouldn't have clicked on. The contents of these advertisements were essentially Flash games or interactive animations injected into a website. So anything you could do in a game, you could build into these ads. And because of that complex nature, you could also get all kinds of data about who was clicking, where they clicked, and so on. Expounding upon a trend that already existed in embryonic form at the time to get more data about more people so more things could be sold to them in a highly targeted way. The emergence of online video, too, was heavily dependent on Flash. YouTube, the first massive-scale online video platform, was almost entirely reliant on Flash for a long time, and this included the very compelling embedding capability that they offered, allowing folks to watch a video on their platform and then embed that video on their own site. This embedding process used Flash. No other ubiquitous standard existed at the time that would allow people to do this. And lacking such a standard, it's an open question as to whether online video would have grown and spread as fast as it did, as early as it did. The early days of online software as well, small applications but also full software suites, was arguably juiced by the emergence of Flash. Software always existed in various formats on the internet and could at times be had by downloading some of the smaller files and installing it on your computer. But the ability to use complex tools online within a browser on a website and to download them in a package that could be used cross-platform, that's a trend that was both amplified and popularized by Flash and the Flash Player and Air software that were distributed along with it. 
allowing people to use these applications. What's happening today in the world of software, then, has been in a great many ways influenced, inspired, and even shaped by Flash. Despite the platform's relatively short period as the darling of multimedia proliferation, online and offline, now, as the format fades, security issues are a major concern as the platform's strength, its ability to inject software, is also a huge liability. Even when fully maintained, but even more so when no longer maintained. But there are parallel concerns about the loss of data, and for lack of a better word, the loss of cultural artifacts that will be buried with Flash as it disappears, for security reasons and for lack of use from modern devices. I've mentioned concerns about the digital dark age on this show previously, but the basic worry here is that as we change coding and media format standards, works that were written, animated, photographed, video recorded, apps made, history documented, all of these things will be lost because no one will have the means to open a flash file on their new devices. The degradation of such formats, then, is akin to the rotting of papyrus or paper, or the weathering of chiseled stone surfaces over time. The information in these storage mediums have a natural lifetime, based on the medium itself, but also based on how well the mediums are maintained, stored, and preserved, and how well we simultaneously maintain the knowledge and tools required to extract that information contained in these end of life media packages in the future. Something written on a stone tablet can last us a long time, but only if we maintain the ability to read the language in which it's written, while also preserving the chiseled text, the stone within which it's embedded. Something created in Flash can be saved to a disk, but if we don't retain the ability to run a Flash file, that file won't do us much good. And with the half-life of some formats decreasing in duration to the point where something highly influential might last maybe a decade before being retired, this concern and the larger concern that we might lose huge swaths of media history due to the lack of preservation efforts for digital information and culture adds up to a larger concern about an overarching digital dark age where we might look back at this period in time in which so much of what we were making and sharing was made in flash, important stuff and comparably unimportant stuff, we might look back and see a gaping hole in our history because we don't know how to access what we managed to save and we didn't manage to save everything that we might. This is already happening to some degree for some portions of the early internet, moments in time in which we didn't have archival tools like we have today though the ones we have today, notably, are also somewhat scattered and imperfect. So Flash is not the only format that we're concerned about here, more holistically. Even the GeoCities era of the internet, though preserved as a searchable torrent file, perhaps won't be preserved in this way forever, and is already inaccessible to many because of its, out of necessity, archived state. The Flash era is a focused version of that larger consideration, then, because its golden age was so distinct, and because it's a proprietary format, it's owned by a company, as opposed to being an open format, the latter of which, at times, allows for more free and unmoderated archival options, while the former tends to be the exclusive stomping grounds of the company that owns it, for most legal purposes, which, at times, can hinder archival efforts. The current batch of backbone tools, the aforementioned HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, would seem to be at least a bit less prone to such issues, as they are iterated by central bodies, but they are, by definition, open. And thus, they tend to be more back and hopefully more accessible across time due to a consequent degree of backward compatibility in future formats of the same coding language. This will continue to be an issue for all mediums of any kind, though, especially digital ones, and especially those that serve as a kind of transitional technology, bridging the gap between one era and another, influential 
and important, but relatively short-lived and easily forgotten. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here, consider becoming a supporter of the show. The simplest way to do that on a regular basis is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. Any amount contributed each month will net you an additional episode of the show each month. But also super helpful are one-off donations, sharing the show with a friend who you think might enjoy it, sharing your favorite episode on your social network of choice, leaving a quick review wherever you get your podcasts. All such efforts are very much appreciated. Thank you very much to everybody who's helping to support the show in some way. You are the reason that I'm able to commit the time that I do to this show each week. And for that, I am very grateful. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called Upheaval, Turning Points for Nations in Crisis by Jared Diamond. Jared Diamond is one of those authors that I read fairly carefully because he's clearly a very smart and well-informed person, but he can also at times be a little bit undercover polemical. But if you read for the data without necessarily taking all of the added-on suppositions as gospel, then you're usually in a pretty good place with his work. And this book was no different from something like Guns, Germs, and Steel. He did a very interesting analysis of, I think it was a half dozen or maybe eight different countries that had faced very serious adversity and very serious turning points, and then emerged on the other side, different because of how they responded to those turning points. So the experience of Finland, especially in regards to its relationship with the Soviet Union and then Russia, is quite interesting. Japan and it facing sudden and unwanted exposure to the rest of the world's economy. There's a lot of very interesting historical stories in this book. And although I do think that some of the conclusions that Diamond comes to are definitely worthy of consideration, To me, the real value of this book was the telling of those historical tales and showing what some of these countries did as societies when they faced these turning points and what things looked like societally before and after those catalytic moments. If any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Upheaval, Turning Points for Nations in Crisis by Jared Diamond. You can find out more about me and my work, including the books that I've written, at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, by searching for it wherever you get your podcasts or by going to brainlenses.com. And you can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on your social network of choice. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and at Colin is my name on most of the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week.